Welcome to Curious City, the podcast from Glasgow Life Museums. I'm David Scott and this is how it works. In each episode, we travel across the city, discovering objects from our collections that link in surprising ways. For this episode, our team have been out at museums and locations around the city, uncovering the stories that surround us. Who knows where we'll go and what we'll see this time. Our guest today is journalist and man behind Lost Glasgow, Norrie Wilson. Norrie, we're not going to say where we are quite yet, but are you a person who likes a museum? I absolutely love museums. I think, like an awful lot of Glasgow kids growing up, I seem to spend every wet Sunday in the Kelvin Grove. It gave mum and dad a bit of peace, because myself and my brother would basically take our shoes off and slide about in our stocking feet and have an absolutely great time. Spend half the time in your knees or visiting the bees the marvellous glass beehive. I mean, I was fascinated with the suits of armour and the swords, the usual small boy stuff, swords and guns. What a place. Norrie, before we dive into the stories this week, can you tell us a little bit about Lost Glasgow? What is it and how did it get started? Sadly, at this point, I have to credit Edinburgh. There was a wonderful site called Lost Edinburgh and I'd spent 14 years working in the Herald and Evening Times in Glasgow. Every day I'd be writing the memories page for the Evening Times, so going through the Glasgow Herald picture archive and pulling out pictures and finding out the stories behind them. And then all of a sudden I discovered there was a Lost Glasgow as well, but I didn't think it was quite as good as the Lost Edinburgh site. So one night after perhaps one or two glasses of wine, I emailed them and said as much and said, you should have a look at Lost Edinburgh, see how they do it. Uh, I woke up the next morning with a slight hangover and a slightly nippy email return saying technically we are lost Edinburgh and if you're so bloody smart about Glasgow why don't you take it on so I did and Brilliant. I, I thought we'd end up with four or five thousand sort of Glasgow history architecture geeks and now across the channels I think we're up about 350,000 followers and it's just mad <laughs> it's incredible I mean, what is it that makes it so popular I think it's relating the stories so many history sites basically just record the dry facts, dates, numbers, names that basically go in one ear and out the other. Because you say to anyone in Glasgow, do you want, you know, do you want to hear about an architect or you know, social history? They'll go, nah mate, thanks very much. You say to anyone in Glasgow, you want to hear a good story? And you've immediately got them hooked. We're a city of stories. Human beings are story animals. Even when we go to bed at night, our brain stays awake telling us stories in the form of dreams. So. It's the stories that hook people in. Have any of the museums in Glasgow featured on Lost Glasgow? Certainly, I mean, various stories around Kelvin Grove. I'm not sure how many I've done down at the Riverside, although one of the things I love about the Riverside is the recreated streets. It's so evocative of a time and a place, uh, and also the old cafe. There's fabulous photographs of the family in the cafe. And all of a sudden you can walk into the space that they inhabited, their daily working space. Nori, you've spilled the beans. We're here again at Riverside for today's episode. But before we start exploring, we're going to head over to Burrow to hear from Laura and Bryony, who are going to talk us through our first object. Any ideas what it might be? Not a clue at the moment. This week we're talking about disasters, objects and stories in the collection that tell of disaster. Let's find out. William Burrow loved antique furniture. That's obvious if you take a trip to the Burrow Collection stores, where we are today. The stores is where we keep the objects which aren't on display, and there are over 900 objects in total in the furniture collection, many from the 16th and 17th centuries. Looking at these tables, chairs, stools and more, you might think about what it would be like to have one of them in your home, whether the chairs are comfortable or if you would want a table like that in your kitchen. You might admire the ornate carvings on many of them and think about how they were made. It's unlikely you'd think of fire, but today, with curator Laura Bald, we're looking at what a chair from the 1680s can tell us about the Great Fire of London. Hi, how are you Hi, today? I'm good, thanks. So what's the connection between the chair that we're looking at and the Great Fire of London? So we're looking at a chair around about 1680, which is known as a walnut and cane chair. And these types of chairs became really fashionable after the Great Fire of London. Now, the Great Fire of London caused a lot of destruction to many people's homes in London, including their belongings. And during the Great Fire, people tried to save their belongings. And trying to move things out of your house, if you imagine there's a fire going on, it'd be quite difficult. And at the time, furniture previous to the Great Fire was really heavy, carved, large pieces of furniture, quite difficult to move out of the way quickly. So afterwards, people were looking for furniture 
to replace the ones they lost that were lightweight, that were portable. And walnut and cane chairs became a real fine example and an opportunity for people. The walnut and the cane as well, they were new imports at the end of the 17th century. Um, A lot of the timber and other construction materials that furniture makers in London would have used also burned in, in the fire. So they had to look for new materials. And you get a whole range here at the Borough Collection. We have from really ornately carved walnut and cane chairs that probably would have been owned by the really wealthy but these chairs were also affordable so there's a kind of unitarian aspect to this type of furniture. You say as well that it was for royals that these chairs were sort of for everyone so does that speak to the destruction from the fire which did kind of reach everyone as well? Yeah so the Great Fire of London itself started on the 2nd of September 1666 and it originated in a bakery on Pudding Lane owned by a man called Thomas Farriner and by the early hours of the morning the fire had progressed. The city at the time was jam-packed with houses. They were wooden constructed buildings all jostled in together like sardines so the fire had no problems jumping from place to place and a lot of our accounts of the fire come from people who were living there at the time. One of them a member of parliament and a very famous cultural figure in the late 17th century called Samuel Pepys. And he actually wrote a diary and he was in London during the Great Fire. And he speaks about going out on the morning of the 2nd of September and travelling down the side of the embankment where the fire was spreading and seeing it going from building to building, seeing people literally pulling things out of their houses, packing them into carts, loading them onto boats in the river. And one other thing he comments on at the time is seeing pigeons from the city trying to land on buildings and the radiation from the fire being so strong that it actually sets their wings alight. So for these people, it must have been like hell had opened up on earth. When we were in the stores here earlier as well, you pointed out to me some Scottish examples of chairs like this. So these things aren't just popular in London. It certainly became fashionable in London and then those furniture trains followed in other kind of regional places. But I suppose further north in Scotland, there was also the fear of fire. And even in Glasgow, there were fires in the 17th century. There were two major fires in Glasgow, one in 1652, And that started in the top of the high street, which was like the medieval centre of the city. And it spread all the way down the high street towards Salt Market, Trongate, Gallagate, towards the the River Clyde. And about 1,000 houses were destroyed. At the time, as much with the Great Fire of London, people didn't have fire brigades like we do now. Instead, all they had was each other, buckets of water. There was another fire in 1677 in Glasgow. And that one destroyed that salt market area again. So people who were still living in that area probably still had living memory of those two fires. In the wake of these two fires, there was a lot of regulations that the council put in to try and protect the city from fire again. After the 1652 fire, they thought about what are the dangerous professions in the city that could potentially cause outbreaks of fire again. The one that they identified was the candle makers. So they moved them to a distinct street just on the outskirts of the city, which today we know as candle rigs. And then after the the 1677 fire, they put in new regulations that houses had to be built with stone. And that's kind of how you see the beginnings of the buildings that we know today in the city. And that's probably why these fires cause the destruction of the medieval parts of the city. We don't have a lot of the medieval architecture left in Glasgow, with the exception of the Glasgow Cathedral and province lordship. That is really fascinating and never would have thought about that just looking at the chairs all over. Thanks so much, Laura. You're very welcome. So surprising to hear there about the scale of the Great Fire of London, but the Glasgow ones seem a little bit forgotten. Cities tend to have very short memories, particularly when it comes to disasters. Most Glasgow kids growing up would know at least a bit about the Great Fire of London. Most people in Glasgow have simply no knowledge of the two great Glasgow fires, which basically wiped out the medieval city. Pretty well every shop, house, everything uh, around Glasgow Cross was burnt flat. Thousands of families were made homeless, and it basically dictated the redevelopment of Glasgow. For our next story this week, we're going to step outside of the museum for a moment. Here we are. It was due to be cloudy, but it's actually a really lovely, Mm. bright, sunny day here. If we head west a little, down river, we can see the BAE shipyard across the Clyde and Lint House. It's this shipyard, then Alexander Stephen and Son, that's the site of our next story. Tuesday, July 3rd, 1883, 
launch day for the SS Daphne, a 500 tonne steamship. Families of the men who built the ship line the riverbank to watch it leave the slipway. But this day of celebration instantly turned into tragedy. With an estimated 200 workmen on board, the ship is launched into the River Clyde, but disaster strikes as soon as she hits the water. The Daphne immediately keels over. Within three minutes, she's sunk. Anchors attached to her for launch failed to work, and it caused her to turn around in the water. The current of the Clyde then caught her and flipped her onto her side. Most of the men on board were inside the Daphne and had little real chance of escape. 70 were saved, but 127 died. 40 women widowed and 150 children left without their main breadwinners as a result. It's still Scottish shipbuilding's worst tragedy. Norrie, another forgotten story. It certainly is, and the only reason I know about it, I was down having a wander around Elder Park in Govan and came across the memorial to the victims of the Daphne disaster. And I literally had to go home and Google Daphne disaster and all of a sudden here's photographs, here's illustrations from London Illustrated News because it was, it was very much a national news story at the time. The TikTok of history moves on, families die off, families move away from the area and all of a sudden the story of the men and the boys. There was 13 and 14 year olds working below decks and it was a disaster for Glasgow. Not just a personal disaster, but a reputational disaster. This was the shipbuilding capital of the world. And one of our new ships had sunk on launch. You imagine what that did to headlines around the world and to Glasgow's reputation, apart from the fact of all the deaths and all the bereavement and all the sadness on the Clyde, because it were affected every yard up and down the Clyde. Everyone in the yards would have known somebody in Stevens of Linthouse who had lost their life that day. Well, we looked at it before we came out, but there's a bottle of Clyde water inside one of the display cases. A sample taken six years before the sinking. Again, it sort of almost connects with the stories of the sea because it looks like a bottle of dark rum. It is so black and so filthy. And today, when we look at the, the tranquil Clyde, where there's seals back up the river, there's salmon back up the river, we forget, I mean, even in my lifetime, the river was absolutely filthy. You wouldn't have gone in it, it would have poisoned you. And also, not just the upper layers of the river, the sediment that was in the river, poisonous metals, all sorts of stuff from the shipyards. Uh, and there's stories with even in the 50s of men falling off gantry work and get into the Clyde. And if they were in feet first, they simply didn't surface because they get buried in that muck just below the water and wouldn't be able to swim out. So, as much as we've lost our shipbuilding to an extent, we've got a bit of the Clyde back, the old Clyde, the Clyde that was a salmon netting river, the Clyde that was a shellfish river, the Clyde that was, you could eat oysters out of. Now, I'm not advising you do that just yet, but the river is returning itself to its natural state. Nori, let's take a quick look at where we've been so far. We started off with the Great Fire of London and the fires of Glasgow, and we've just spoken about the biggest loss of life that the Clyde has ever seen. Let's head back inside to take a look at our next object. OK, we're back inside and upstairs on the bridge at Riverside. Now, despite its size, the bat, as it's known, is actually quite easy to miss. Nori, what are we looking at? Well, what I think we would describe today as a hang glider, except it's a hang glider before hang gliders existed. It's one of the earliest forms of manned flight. And it hangs up here in the rafters, and it's so gossamer thin and so delicate that you can, you can just walk straight past it without noticing it or discovering the wonderful story behind it. We're looking at a modern day replica of the bat. The original was built here in Glasgow by its inventor, Percy Pilcher. Earlier this week we made our way up the hill to Glasgow University to find out more about Percy and his bat. We're standing in the cloisters of Glasgow University with John Messner who's joined us before. Hi David. Good morning John, how are you? I'm good, yourself? I'm very well. John, let's step outside for a moment. Somewhere right. a little bit quieter. That's better. Out at one of the highest spots in the city, and what a view looking down over to Kelvin Grove. But the view of Kelvin Grove is perhaps something the person we're here today to talk about wouldn't have seen when he was here, John. Yes, that's right. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Percy Pilcher when he was in Glasgow in the 1890s, there was no Kelvin Grove Museum, but it was still a high part of the city, looking down on um, the tenements and the shipyards beyond. And Percy was a man who had a dream, and his dream, shared by others across the globe, was to become the first person to fly. 
Percy Pilcher. Can you tell us a little bit about Percy? Is Percy a Glasgow boy? No, no, not originally. He was born in Bath. Uh, he joined the Royal Navy as a young man and served several years across the globe. And then in the early 1890s, he came up to Glasgow to work as a draftsman at one of the shipyards in the city. Glasgow being you know, the home of, of shipbuilding, not just in Britain, but across the world. So a place where he wanted to further his skills and his career. And that led him to start thinking about wider things, not just ships on the sea, but could man take to the air. We'd had steam engines, we'd had railways, we'd had steamships. But one of the things that was still eluding Percy and the others was to get it into the air and to create an airship. You've mentioned flight being on the minds of many across the world. These others, were they in communication with Percy? Percy was in touch with specifically a man called Otto Lilienthal, uh, a German who lived near Berlin. He was one of the very early pioneers and, and they exchanged ideas. They, they said, well, I'm, I'm interested in doing this flight thing. You know, what are you doing? You know, maybe I can come and visit you. And that's what Percy did. He actually went out to, to Berlin in the, in the spring of 1895. And this was after a couple years of developing his own ideas here in Glasgow. Specifically, he, he lived just right around the corner. We're at the university, but he lived at a flat just around the corner on Byers Road with his sister. And I really want to uh, you know, kind of mention a lot about Ella, his sister, because she was a great supporter of him, but also she helped him build those early models. She helped him sew onto them. And they made so much racket building these um, these flying machines, these kites, you know, sawing, cutting, hammering, that his landlady asked him to leave. And at that time, he had his idea for what would become known as the Bat, or the Bat Mark II, and that's in April of 1895. And just a couple months later, he's not here at the university, although it's a big enough hill, he probably could have done it. He went out to a farm near Cardross, so just down the River Clyde, down towards Helensboro. Nice clear space for him, south facing, you get a nice winds coming off the Clyde. And that's when in June of 1895, he successfully flew his bat for the first time and really becoming kind of the first British person to do a heavier than air manned flight. John, what happened to Percy? Well, Percy, after he left Glasgow, he moved down to England and he was in the employment of a man named Hiram Maxim. And some people might know that name from the machine gun that he developed, but also Maxim was interested in, in flight. And in 1899, uh, after he left that company, Percy was once again up in the air. He was up in a, a glider called the Hawk. And unfortunately, something went wrong. And he was up at a, a pretty great height at that point, And he fell down. He sustained quite serious injuries. And three days later, he passed away. And his legacy for those who came after him? His legacy, it isn't a kind of technolo technological one. You know, his designs didn't lead to the Wright brothers. And for, for listeners who don't know who the Wright brothers, they're the ones who are credited with the first sustained mechanical flight. They were bicycle makers in Ohio, and they were able to, in December of 1903, fly their biplane, which was still made out of wood and canvas, very similar to, to Percy's materials, but there was an engine on it with propellers, and they were able to sustain that flight. Somebody on the cusp of an amazing discovery, an amazing shift. So if he hadn't passed away then, we might have been talking about the man whose first experiments were here in Glasgow, who latterly became the first person ever to fly, which, you know, we're 120-some years later, we're landing missions on the moon. It's just an amazing connection we have here in Glasgow. Is there a modern-day equivalent who's innovated in the same well, way that Percy has? You might point to people like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. They're going into space. They're definitely innovating how we do space travel, how we do space exploration. But they're kind of like the money guys. They're the funders. They have their ideas. But Percy and Lilienthal and the Wright brothers, they were in their houses. They were in their garages. They were buying the wood at the wood merchant and doing it themselves. So it's, it's hard to make that connection. But you might look at maybe your Bill Gates, the guys who are making their computers in their backyards, in their garages, using bits that other people had done and speaking to other people, home computer innovators in the 1970s, early 1980s, that then led to this kind of global transformation of communication, of, of everything we do. And that's what Percy and the Wright brothers and Lilienthal in their garages, in their flats, here in the West End, leading to you know, this global connection of aerospace travel. We're in here at the university and we've timed it perfectly because there's some kind of graduation or convocation happening behind us. There's people in their robes and they have flowers and families. And, you know, Percy was here 130 years ago. He would have seen something like that. And I don't think you know, someone over there could be the next innovator, could be the next Percy Pilcher or, or Bill Gates or Elon Musk or, or, or anybody like that. And it's amazing to think that Percy as a, a mid-20s, early 30-year-old man 
have this kind of connection that we still live with today. Nori, did you know about Percy Pilcher? I knew about him very vaguely, simply because I'd, I'd come across photographs of him and thought, what the hell am I looking at here? Because you know, some of them he does genuinely look like the Batman from the films. As much as it was called the bat, it could equally be called the butterfly because it's, it's so absolutely gossamer thin. You know, to continue the almost like the sort of butterfly analogy, you know, the fact that you know, caterpillars become butterflies and can fly, this, what we're looking at, is really the, the birth of manned flight. You know, if you're jumped on a holiday jet this year, think back to Percy, leaping off a hillside strapped to this contraption. Forgotten histories, changing times. We've stepped outside of the museum again. Central Station, Queen Street Station. The names that come to mind when you think of Glasgow's big railway stations. But there was a third. St. Enoch Station and Hotel dominated St. Enoch Square in the city centre until it was demolished in 1977. In 1903, St. Enoch Station was the site of a major rail crash. Michael's here with us today to tell us more about it. It's July 27th, 1903. The platforms are filled with family and friends waiting for the 0650 arrival of the Ardross into Glasgow. As they stood by Platform 8 waiting for the loved ones or to take the train itself, excitement turned to horror as the driver misjudged the distance left to run. Despite putting on the brakes, it was too late. The train hit the buffers and the carriages telescoped into each other, resulting in 16 deaths and 64 injuries. The day in question, it was, it was the, the last day of the Glasgow Fair and it's the train coming up from Rawson, so it's going to be loaded with mums and dads, sons and daughters, wains, buckets and spades, you know, looking back and thinking that was a great wee holiday. And then all of a sudden, wallop, huge almighty crash and screams and absolute panic. You know, today if something like that happened at Central, they'd immediately go into yeah. automatic pilot. But back then, yeah. it would just be, God, what do we do now? We've got, basically we've got dead people on the platform, we've got carriages smashed to matchsticks. And how do we get in there and how do we help the injured? And just what are we going to do next? Yeah. To this day, the St Enoch disaster is the worst buffer stop disaster in British railway history. It's a real tragedy happening in the city centre. Nori, when you look at old photographs at St Enoch, it looks really magnificent. This palatial Victorian station stood like this huge red sandstone wall overlooking yeah. St Enoch Square. And it really was impressive. Two huge railway sheds with their glazed roofs. I mean, they're equal to anything in London. Big, long, sweeping drive up to the front, the carriage drive, in the days when you'd you know, you'd hire a horse and carriage to go to the station. Because we forget just how much the coming of the railways shaped the centre of Glasgow. Mm. Central Station wiped out the old ancient village of Grahamston. Queen Street Station was built into the side of what had originally been a huge quarry. And St Enoch's, everything from the east side of St Enoch Square right through to the salt market was basically wiped out. And this was a really important and highly populated area of Glasgow. Yeah. It had originally been posh houses, well-to-do merchants, but obviously as the great sort of move of money went west, it slightly fell into disrepair, but it was almost a square mile of the city that was cleared to allow the railway lines to come in and out of the city. And they, just as in the 1700s, there's been a canal building mania. By the time the railways come along, there's a rail building mania. Yeah. Fortunes were being made and lost literally daily. And if you if you struck it lucky, you know, you put a few hundred pounds in. You know this it's like you know only fools and horses. This time next year, Rodney, millionaires, <laughs> and that happened to some folk, but it obviously didn't happen to the folk that lived in the site of Serena. They were basically just basically the landlord said, "I've sold the building, get out." Lastly, on that, Nori, some of the story here is about regeneration. It's that sort of strange thing because folk often ask me, Nori, if you'd a time machine, which bit of Glasgow's history would you go back to? And I would say, I wouldn't go back. Mm. I want to go 50 years into the future. Yeah. I want to go 100 years into the future because it's that nice thing. People say, what do you think about Glasgow? And I always say, well, it'd be nice when it's finished. The story of constant renewal in Glasgow has always been the story of Glasgow. And as much as we might not like change, you've got to embrace change because sure as hell change is going to embrace you. Where we're standing just now, down at the Riverside Museum, I'm looking across and the new bridge is going over from Water Row over to here in Partick. 
that's going to be a game changer. Yeah. That's going to link two bits of the city that historically, going back millennia, were link, linked by ferries, linked by rowing boats, and now you're going to be able to walk on water, basically. You, know, you can have a pint in the in Govan and then walk up to party, yeah. or vice versa, or ride your bike. No longer do you have to go the long way around. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Nori, thank you very much. My pleasure. It's always nice to speak about this city. That's it for this episode of Curious City. Huge thanks to Nori Wilson for being our guest. We covered a lot of ground today. Some forgotten histories. Great fires. The sad story of the SS Daphne. Percy Pilcher's bat. And we've ended up at Salinas. Next time, we're heading south. Can you guess where? I was going good. And then I went the wrong way. And I got overtaken by an extremely fast, probably 13 or 14 year old girl. See you next time on Curious City. <laughs>